things focused on uh, the deployment and the community engagement. I'm gonna be talking a bit more about uh, technology that uh, addresses some of the same smart city concerns uh, that the previous presentation alluded to, uh, not so much focusing on the individual sensor, but on systems. So first of all, I, well, we often talk in the smart city context about the Internet of Things as kind of the umbrella term uh, that we use to describe these type of systems. Uh, this is not, I believe, terribly useful simply because uh, it encompasses such a wide range of infrastructures and devices and applications that differ so dramatically as to whether they're mobile, whether they're high or low bandwidth, whether they have latency requirements, as the previous presentation mentioned, uh, on, say, a traffic control, uh, whether these devices are deployed in indoor or outdoor or in uh, more rural areas, and how cost sensitive they are. However, there are a number of commonalities that all of these systems have. Uh, Namely, they have to deal with the unique challenges, technical and non-technical, of a smart city style deployment. Right? So we think of IoT often as something that is used within the home, but uh, IoT for the smart city is not just a scaled up version of the smart home. Uh, in particular, unlike in the home, uh, we deal with strangers uh, that don't necessarily trust each other. Uh, in that. Uh, the numbers of sensors and actuators is an order of magnitude or several orders of magnitude larger than even the largest building typically would have. And in particular, and this is where it differs from say campus level deployments or uh, even uh, deployments within the home certainly is that in many cases, the best deployment of smart city uh, applications are those that serve not just one sector or part of the administration, but serve multiple sectors. Again, the previous talk alluded to that indirectly in that it involved public safety, uh, environmental control and monitoring, uh, public transit maybe, uh, noise concerns or quality of life concerns, and many more. And the whole point of a smart city, I believe, is to have reusable infrastructure so that you do not have to deploy new infrastructure for each vertical application. That also means that we want to decouple the functions and software uh, that we run uh, on uh, these particular systems from the device identities. I will be talking about that. So there's a fair amount of talk about kind of having an IoT in ecosystem, that term is thrown around a lot. So it means that we really have kind of a combination of kind of a living part of it, namely the active devices, the users of those, the applications that are run in that. And then we have some non-living components uh, in that, that just are more descriptive. So the entities and attributes, and they interact as a system. Uh, in the sense that they communicate with each other. So maybe that label is a reasonably good um, approximation, but we have to look at the whole system, not just a component. So just to give you an idea of the scale that we're talking about is they differ dramatically by several orders of magnitude. So for example, electric meters uh, in the United States would be about 136 million or so housing units each probably has an electric meter of some sort. Uh, traffic lights, however, are a much smaller count, right? only about 30,000 or so. Um, and traffic uh, control devices such as parking meters are, are at least for traditional one is a very large number, uh, a smaller number as they now emerge with the more centralized uh, systems. And then we have vehicles and light poles, for example. In that. So again, depending on what we're deploying, we could be talking anywhere from a few 10,000 uh, to millions and hundreds of millions of devices. So the goals that we are pursuing as part of our project 
is to address a particular narrow issue that I believe are faced by almost all large scale systems. Namely, the first challenge of managing a large scale system is naming things so that you can uh, address those devices that you know whether devices are the same over time and space, uh, and that you can write programs that you feel confident will actually deliver on what you intended. So we want these naming to be robust. And we know this just in our, if we have any IoT devices at home, we typically don't refer these devices when we control them by internet address or domain name or anything like that. We simply say, turn off the kitchen lights and we assume that that means something to the system. So as noted, so I won't repeat it, edge computing allows us to reduce some of the privacy risks and network transmissions. Uh, but it also means that we need to support smaller programming languages rather than just a full cloud environment. I believe for IoT and smart cities to become successful, they have to allow the rapid deployment of new applications uh, by uh, domain experts who are maybe not the most ace software developers. They should be able to use, for example, programming languages that are familiar to data scientists uh, and environmental engineers, not necessarily those who are most comfortable for people who've had a formal computer science education in that. We would like to cover the architectures that range from Arduino class, very small devices, cheap sensors, uh, to more full-fledged computing devices, say running a Linux style operating system, a Raspberry Pi step one. And um, most importantly, we want to be able to have these naming systems encompass multiple administrative domains. So what are the kind of programming models and uh, network interactions that are commonly used today? Uh, there are probably about three of them, two HTTP-like uh, mechanisms that both rely on a REST model and an event subscription model typically implemented in uh, smart city type of applications at a standard space uh, using a simple uh, pub sub publish subscribe protocol called MQTT. So let me talk first about the notion of geospatial name. I, so the first kind of uh, motivation for that is nobody wants to uh, program in these rope or R protocols. Nobody wants to write HTTP or MQTT applications directly. Indeed, one could argue that the progress of networking has really been driven by the development of more user and programmer friendly uh, programming environments, starting really from the socket API that you know, most computer science graduates will be familiar with, all the way to notions dating back maybe 10, 15 years, uh, where you simplify on scripting style languages, uh, simplify common network interaction patterns in that so that you no longer even know that this is a particular protocol. You simply access this like you would do a file, for example. Indeed, there have been many failed attempts on the other side that uh, actually tried to provide these interfaces, but were either too complex uh, or too brittle to really find favor with programmers uh, and uh, faded over time. So as I said, most um, IoT and smart city programmers, uh, uh, specialists will not be programmers. And in particular, they won't have a networking or telecom background. So we need to cater to their skill set, not vice versa. Addressing our devices is not just a programming convenience, but if you do it wrong, could cause significant harm. Just imagine that you uh, address the wrong uh, actuator, like a traffic light, and accidentally set the wrong light to green, uh, that would clearly have potentially dire consequences. And indeed, many of the identifiers that are used commonly in uh, systems such as electric utility management uh, rely on either IP addresses, MAC addresses, or device-specific domain names. None of those work well. They change in unpredictable ways, 
for example, when swapping out hardware or they're just uh, make programs very specific to a particular hardware environment that changes over time, making these programs and applications nearly impossible to manage. So we're developing uh, a set of naming schemes that uh, try to meet a set of requirements. They should not depend on uh, network topology. They need to span multiple administrative domain. They should have meaningful semantics. Uh, they should allow uh, that you can resolve to either one or more devices, so semantically address groups. Um, you want to fail rather than address the wrong device. It's better to have an explicit failure than do something that you didn't intend. Uh, and if possible, they should self-identify. And this is even a problem uh, at a very much smaller scale. So this is the notion of when you change a device, suddenly your in-home routines have to change. Uh, namely, you have to now suddenly change all these old programs that you wrote even within a single home. So this prob problem appears well before you reach uh, smart city scale. So we've been using directory models to provide uh, the, this functionality. So we add a, a level of indirection so that query the directory of various sides to get uh, the devices so that the program never actually interacts directly with the directory. So there's a single source of truth, if you like, to map devices to programmer visible identifiers. Again, why we often rely on names that are geographically based simply because in the smart city, most of the sensors have a geographic scope. Again, they're typically displayed on a map for that reason. Uh, so this is a very natural way of addressing devices and incorporating those into a program independent of the hardware a situation and independent of say, changes in device or not. So how do we get these type of names and maps in that? So we've been exploring our four broad classes of devices. So Google Maps are very popular for kind of hobbyist type of ones because they uh, have a relatively easy to use programming interface, but they cannot easily be modified. Uh, OpenStreetMap has assumed a new uh, prominence simply because it is more readily amenable uh, to additions to the underlying mapping database, for example. But generally speaking, for example, it only offers a 2D version, uh, unlike Google Maps, which often now has a, a floor level description of public buildings and not. Complementary to that are building information management systems, uh, which also incorporate often the dimension of time, namely you can track as to how the building has changed over time. And then more informal floor plans, which are used for all kinds of applications from safety uh, to energy management. So as one uh, simple application, we have been uh, on the indoor side of things, have been translating informal low resolution floor plans, such as what you typically find in you know, an elevator or an escape route type of designation uh, in that into OpenStreetMap so that they can be overlaid on and oriented on, on top of that map. Go through a set of steps to then translate uh, these informal maps, uh, low, relatively low resolution, but available for many even older buildings uh, without having to go to the architect into uh, the OpenStreetMap environment. So we can create a geo-JSON object uh, that we then align and translate into that. And so now every uh, device, if it's a room level device, now uh, also acquires derived longitude and latitude information, which can then be used on larger maps that go beyond a building. Let me talk a bit about the programming model uh, and that, namely that what we are looking at are two basic models that have different trade-offs. Namely, one is that this is directly integrated into uh, a programming launch, a fictitious kind of programming language here that reflects as to how Python and PHP and Ruby and so on and uh, JavaScript 
uh, look like uh, in, uh, in the sense that what you do is you enumerate these devices, say, as just by a property uh, one, or you can directly translate this into, say, an SQL query that then provides a list of those that you set and they become objects that you uh, query or um, set values to, and then that those directly influence the state of the object. So from a programmer perspective, protocols aren't visible. It's not uh, visible, say, uh, whether this translates into an HTTP request or some other uh, programming and networking environment. It is simply just setting a device um, state in that particular case. Uh, we can also use a pure SQL model where you directly interface two devices uh, via an SQL interface, as opposed to through an intermediary where you first select the devices and then uh, access them through an object interface. Uh, both can be implemented in the same system. Uh, they have different trade-offs uh, in that. And indeed, in other programming environments, that's what people do. So we've been building uh, the second environment, I uh, call Send SQL, and a, a query language for sensors based on uh, geographic SQL uh, that presents an SQL interface to large scale IoT uh, applications. The advantage of that is that it provides a standard spaced, very high level, um, and declarative as opposed to a procedural interface to, to these devices. Um, almost every data scientist has at least some familiarity with basic uh, SQL that's widely taught, and it is widely supported uh, on almost all compute platforms, both large and small. However, we don't have a single database. The distinguishing facet is that we uh, aggregate SQL queries to the relevant uh, IoT storage nodes, which might be either at the edge uh, for pure edge computing cap models or to uh, aggregates like that to aggregate a bunch of devices that are typically very too small to host their own database or don't have continuous network connectivity in them. And we then aggregate the response data across these devices so that uh, the application designer doesn't have to worry about that. So we want to uh, create a decentralized, federated uh, system uh, that allows us to use uh, this SQL for these applications. So uh, just to give you an example of the kind of queries that are very easy to write in that type of environment, and indeed it ties back to some of the usage examples given in the previous talk. So uh, for example, you can easily find uh, aggregate computations such as find the minimum or maximum value. I uh, discover a sensor along, say, a road uh, that you have. Uh, you find uh, a set of sensors that you want to have that have certain qualities. Uh, you do averaging over time, um, and you find particular kinds of sensors. So for example, uh, this is hypothetical deployment. We have not deployed this in real time. We are doing a simulation at the moment. Is it is very easy using existing database query models without extending on any, on the language in any way, just using the geographic features of um, SQL implementations. Uh, to get data in ways that are, even if you've never seen an SQL query, you can probably tell roughly what this does. Namely, you want a time series in this case, I would say a particular, let's just PM 2.5, uh, air quality measurements from a database in that, that is geographically con uh, contained in that, and you want this to be time ordered. Again, it uh, doesn't depend on the devices, you can swap out device models. Uh, it simply depends on a high level interface that is hopefully would be uh, stable for, for many years, regardless of the changes in networks and devices and uh, sensors. And again, we can also do this within the room uh, indoors. So in both indoor and outdoors can be uh, unified into the same basic model. 
what we implement that is we have a distributed uh, set of databases and a, a database routing engine, what's called an SQL proxy. We uh, derive that from an existing um, open source effort that we enhance uh, with a geospatial uh, database that relies both on a building model as well as open street map. So this creates a set of what we call autonomous cyber-physical systems. Uh, this is derived from the notion of the autonomous system that is familiar to networking um, experts. And it provides us with a description of these devices uh, as a service descriptor, which is then imported into the database. And we built a uh, system that allows us to publish those through a registrar uh, so that new devices can automatically uh, find those uh, particular services without having to explicitly be made aware of those. And we have built a prototype service uh, which implements these. So these are the screenshots uh, in a, of a simulated system at the moment. Uh, that creates these type of interfaces and provides for responses. So what are some of the future uh, opportunities uh, for that? So currently, uh, we have been uh, building this primarily for selecting um, system, uh, query type of one, so select data. In that. However, uh, SQL also offers the opportunity to provide a update insert type of activities where you can actually have a notion that you would do a timed update. So for example, it is very natural to express uh, an update into a timetable, even if that is in the future, so that you would say you would set this actuator, say for temperature one to 21 degrees Celsius for a particular time of day. Uh, and that's when you insert that into the table and that automatically triggers an, an update uh, in that region, say, to that particular value. So that provides you at the same time with both an actuation and it also automatically logs activity. And it is now easy to say, see uh, what the device actually did. So somebody on the outside can now observe I, on the outside who's authorized naturally, can observe what you're doing in the future to avoid conflicts uh, with that. So they can predict what's happening uh, before it actually happens and avoid overriding it inadvertently. So we are still designing as to how that will work. So it will likely uh, involve some notion of a REST interface underneath that. Uh, SQL also provides uh, the functionality known as triggers, uh, which are uh, events that are triggered when a particular row in the database is updated, say, or inserted. So almost all databases of any size support that, and it's often used to create larger applications. This ties very naturally to the very commonly used a notion of NQTT events where you could subscribe to those and those of them uh, create a trigger in the database. In the last few years, there has been a lot of interest in creating what are known as time series databases. So, so far I have emphasized primarily the notion of space, uh, but there's also been an interest in better supporting notions of time. So these are typically used for very large scale data sets that have a strong time component, often streaming data. But that matches almost perfectly many of the sensors that we would use in a smart city. Uh, so these type of databases are optimized for aggregating uh, time-based uh, data items, elements into aggregate information so that you can derive insights into that through time series analysis uh, in that that would be hard to do uh, otherwise. And so there's a number of commercial and open source efforts that allow you to do that. And so uh, rather than uh, just simply feeding the data uh, into that, maybe that should be the primary interface for many type of sensors that have a strong uh, sensor database for uh, sensor measurements, this would not be suitable, for example, for a video um, 
type of application. So again, uh, wrapping up our, the discussion, I, we believe that thinking about the interaction with sensors is becoming increasingly important as we move from prototypes to large scale systems that indeed span the whole city, span multiple administrations, administrations uh, span uh, long time scales of deployment, not just a duration of a research project. There has been a lot of work on at the networking level, on application layer and even lower level uh, network protocols to support these applications, but generally they have focused on the protocol level. Uh, they assume that these devices are directly addressable. Uh, they sometimes have query languages, but they don't generally take into account as to how you manage these large agglomerations of hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of sensors uh, that slowly evolve over time. Thus, it is time to think beyond these type of protocols and see what is the next layer of integration. And a primary consideration, if we want the census to actually be used beyond the end of a research project, is whatever kind of abstractions that the data scientists and domain experts uh, that work in cities uh, and in um, Student scientists, like was mentioned in the previous presentation, are that may be tem more temporary user, whatever kind of abstractions that actually allow these users to quickly and easily uh, draw on those resources, because otherwise they'll either not do the project at all, or they'll find their own implementation because it's easier to build something new than uh, try to understand the uh, low level interfaces provided by whatever somebody else did before. One of the questions then is where all should this functionality reside? Uh, should it be at the edge on the device itself? Should it be um, somewhat more regional, let's say within a subset of a city? Uh, should it be in uh, data centers? Uh, and where should the data reside? Uh, should we keep more of the data? In, uh, the edge devices, uh, that means it is probably uh, easier to keep uh, it private, but it also means that uh, it's subject to destruction of a physical kind uh, when the device uh, uh, fails and it may be harder to aggregate the data. And uh, how much do we care about historical data, for example, and that uh, we can't often predict what we need, but storing all data is probably not the right uh, either. Uh, the SQL model works, uh, from what we can tell, quite nicely for discrete, uh, either scalar or small dimensional vectors. Uh, it does not tend to work as well for, say, images uh, and other uh, kind of higher dimensional and higher data uh, size objects in that. So probably other uh, abstractions are needed for those, probably pre-processed as opposed to the raw image data in that. And a topic that I have not talked about, uh, but that it's become quite clear is if we care about privacy um, and if we care about uh, data that has um, more of a, is of a more sensitive nature, say data from inside of buildings, we need to make sure that access control uh, is integrated into the system from the very beginning. We can't just assume that all data is public uh, in that. And agencies sometimes have proprietary interest uh, in say subsets of their data uh, for a variety of reasons, good and bad. So we need to think from the very beginning when we build these programming abstractions, how can we restrict access, but make that restriction transparent and in particular, easy to test so that we don't have inadvertent data disclosures as are common for some of the cloud systems. And that concludes my presentation. I'm glad to take any questions or comments that people might have on this particular topic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor schulz -Riener. I can see that uh, Enrique is raising his hand. Yeah, um, um, 
Hello, hello, um, Professor Henning. Uh, very nice to, to meet you, and thank you for this interesting explanation about the different way of uh, looking into the data that uh, we may find in the typical infrastructure on a, a smart city. And uh, I was surprised because uh, most of the times when we um, we heard about smart cities and uh, the huge data that we can can get from these uh, these uh, applications normally we uh, heard about big data and when we talk about big data we we, we speak about non scale uh, implementations like uh, ada and um, you show with us that uh, that's not necessarily the case and uh, what i want to want to ask you if you can elaborate if uh, uh, there are clear advantage uh, in favor of keeping SQL on this type of uh, application domain where there is a huge number of data and the need for, uh, um, for, for crossing information between different fields is absolutely necessary. And normally this is uh, the advantage that uh, ADOP and the similar uh, technologies can provide us. So, Basically, if you see that this new, let, let me call it them this way, these new technologies have really advantage over SQL, or, and well, if you think they, they, they will live together, if there is any possible problems in the future, if you mix these two technologies in the same, in the same uh, uh, environment. Yep, and this is a very good, uh, question to uh, to follow up on, and let me maybe explain that I see two kinds of aggregation uh, that are possible. Namely, one is um, as you alluded to at the device level, uh, namely that you would have a device uh, or very close to the device stored on database. Uh, for that, I believe that is mainly interesting for devices that are uh, energy and uh, communication constraints. So there's a lot of interest in say, uh, LoRa and similar type of uh, low bandwidth networks where uh, transmission of data is of, uh, incurs significant cost, uh, in both in terms of energy and in terms of uh, network cost. And so, and most of the data is really not used at all. It's just 99% uh, of the data is of no interest to anybody because uh, it's just measuring the same uh, normal value like it, normal, like it does. And it's really only of interest if something quote interesting happens, something out of bounds, air pollution, uh, temperature, whatever. Uh, in that. The second one, which is I didn't talk about as much, is that even when you believe in kind of big data, one of the difficulties is that in a smart city, many of these applications are going to be maintained by different agencies within the city. Uh, again, public safety, public transit, uh, environment, the environmental department, whatever it happens to be called in the city, probably maintain their own sensor network. But I often want to integrate those uh, into a single application. As an application designer, I don't really care if a sensor is operated, let's say an air quality sensor by bus stops, by the transit agency, say, or by um, environmental agency. In that. I want as many sensors that are in my area of interest as I can get. And so we see our approach as being useful for that second one, even though those databases that we aggregate are really traditional uh, my MySQL, Oracle style databases uh, in that. So I, I don't see that as a universal one. It really depends, it gives you an additional kind of level uh, to uh, address both administrative distribution and data access uh, pattern distribution to reduce unnecessary data transfer more at the, at the low level. Thank you. I think we have another question from Professor Dagioklas. Uh, yes, uh, thanks for your interesting presentation. Actually, I have uh, three questions. Uh, the first question um, uh, has to do with uh, time series that you mentioned. So my question is whether you have considered the use of uh, machine learning in order to do prediction, right? Because in certain use case scenarios, 
uh, prediction uh, is quite useful. Uh, the second one is uh, whether for this uh, uh, sensor SQL we have uh, considered uh, uh, use case scenarios associated uh, with uh, uh, geofencing and um, real-time uh, positioning and tracking uh, uh, indoor in a complex building. And the third question has to do with uh, privacy and security. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, a lot of good questions. Let me see if I can get uh, to those um, in a short time. Uh, so, I, the privacy, I'll start with that. Um, the privacy and security one, yes, this is a uh, clearly a major concern. Um, and this is, I alluded to that. Uh, I didn't have time to present that. We've been looking at exactly what you described, namely geofenced access in that. So we believe that actually integrating uh, the geo component into the database, either as a separate directory of devices or directly into the, the data part of the device, makes it easier to do uh, geofenced style applications. Um, I don't know if that's what you had in mind, but a very common access pattern for some devices, less for analytical purposes, more for just day-to-day -day interactions, are indeed based on geographic constraints in the sense that often our permissions are governed by the ability to reach physical devices today. I mean, we don't put passwords on physical light switches or thermostats in buildings, even that we, those we don't own, like my university buildings. Uh, if you are in a room, um, if you made, if you gained access to the building, you typically can turn the lights on and off, and you might even be able to adjust the temperature and uh, raise the blinds or whatever. Uh, and so we anticipate similar models of geofence access uh, to that as well. And we have a parallel effort uh, as part of this project that looks exactly at the kind of geofencing in that. The privacy one is, and this is part of the access control um, aspect that I didn't talk about, is that often um, access control is actually more complicated than simply saying, yep, you can access the sensor, or no, you can't. So to just to give you an example in the indoor context is you could imagine that real-time occupancy data for a room would be considered sensitive because you can uh, detect whether the room is occupied and you might worry that a criminal might use that, say, to scope out a place and see where it would be good, when would be good opportunity uh, to to steal some equipment from a university lab, just to take a university example uh, in that. But historical information or aggregate information might be far less sensitive. So you might, uh, because it may not allow you to derive direct information about uh, the behavior or actions of a person right now. So for example, historical traffic data uh, about Vehicles, I, again, this was shown in one of the example of the PATH data that is anonymized might have far lower thresholds of privacy concern in that. So one of the ways that we envision that in part of the SQL model is that certain operations um, might be less restricted uh, than others, particularly ones that aggregate data as opposed to do real-time queries. Uh, and we also envision that, uh, for example, certain um, applications might want to restrict the frequency of querying, again, because you might often be able to derive information about, say, your personal behavior by repeatedly querying for individual data, say, again, occupancy data. Uh, you can get a pretty good notion of how people move by repeatedly querying uh, multiple occupancy sensors in rapid succession. Uh, so we, in our model of access control, we restrict uh, that level of access control. But these are clearly things that should be built into the system uh, and integrated into the design from the very beginning so that uh, we can make expose that uh, to the system designers in a way that they can reason about, that they get reasonable feedback when they try to do that, and that they can access devices that they actually offer us to um, access as opposed to uh, making that a failure scenario later where they get a thousand devices but almost none of them are actually accessible that serves nobody 
Thank you.